on World News Tonight. Mass shooting. ex thai cop kills 24 children in a knife and gun rampage before taking his own life. The ring of war. U.S. President Joe Biden warns that the threat of nuclear Armageddon risk is in an all-time high since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Iran sanctioned. European Parliament calls for EU sanctions on Iran over repression of street protests. And Geeks United. Self-proclaimed Geeks unite on the first day of the New York Comic Con. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And we're starting off tonight's broadcast with some tragic news as spears of dried blood still stain the wooden floor of a classroom in Northern Thailand. A day after the country's worst massacre unfolded in perhaps one of the most unlikely places. Shock and horror in Thailand Thursday as a convoy of ambulances carried away the bodies of 34 people, including 23 children, who were killed in a knife and gun rampage at a daycare center. Teachers who narrowly escaped the killing spree recounted the devastating scene. Three of us went out. I thought he wouldn't come in because two other teachers had died. He held the children. The other teacher, an assistant, we tried telling them, but they were on the phone. It all went down really fast. He was slashing the knife. He didn't use the gun. He kept slashing in there. It was all by a knife. He didn't say anything. He shot at the door while the children were sleeping. He used his feet to kick the window. Then he shot at the door. I thought he got inside. I ran to the kitchen behind. I was in shock. I didn't know what to do. Authorities said a former police officer carried out the massacre and later returned home to shoot dead his wife and child before turning the gun on himself. Police said he was dismissed from his post last year over drug allegations and was facing trial on a drugs charge. Police also said he had been in court earlier in the day, then went to the daycare center to collect his son. But when he did not find him there, the rampage began. It's one of the world's worst child death tolls in a massacre by a single killer in recent history. A local official told Reuters the age range of children at the daycare center was from two to five years old. A district official told Reuters that about 30 children were at the daycare center, fewer than usual because of heavy rain. U.S. President Joe Biden states that Russia's latest acts of aggression points to the world facing another crisis similar to the Cuban Missile Crisis and suggests that the world is moving towards another stage of brinkmanship. A stern warning from the U.S. President. The risk of a nuclear Armageddon is at its highest level since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Biden says Russian President Vladimir Putin was not joking when he spoke of using tactical nuclear weapons after suffering setbacks in his war in Ukraine. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky told an Australian think tank NATO should consider preventative strikes if Moscow decides to use nuclear weapons. In a sign of tension, Zelensky's press secretary later explained that the president meant preventative sanctions and not strikes. What should NATO do? Eliminating the possibility of Russia using nuclear weapons. But above all, I again appeal to the international community, as I did on the February 24th, preventive strikes so Russia knows what will happen if they use them. The Kremlin has denounced Zelensky's comments. Putin has repeatedly alluded to using his country's vast nuclear arsenal, including last month when he announced plans to conscript Russian men to serve in Ukraine. He has also accused the West of engaging in nuclear blackmail. Leaders of the European Union and the neighbours from Britain to Turkey met to discuss security and energy emergencies plaguing them all since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a symbolic summit that underlined Moscow's isolation. 
French President Emmanuel Macron was warmly greeted by Czech leader Peter Fiala at a castle in Prague on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the Thank idea. you. Macron is among leaders of European nations and some from outside of the European Union, gathering to discuss shared security and energy problems. It's a rare and symbolic summit of some 44 states, with one notable absence, Russia. This Prague gathering is the brainchild of the French leader, the inaugural meeting of what Macron calls the European political community. The objective is to share the same understanding of the situation, which is affecting Europe, and to battle out a common strategy, so a strategic conversation, which doesn't really exist at the moment, and which could reduce the divisions. And I hope that we can come out of this with a common project. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said that many of the problems facing those gathered stemmed from Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. He told reporters, quote, we don't accept that part of a neighboring country is annexed. But beyond lofty declarations, there were doubts about the forum's concrete goals and actions. And apart from unity in the face of Russian military aggression, it's unclear what this gathering really unites or what it might accomplish. In addition to core EU members such as the German Chancellor, inside the castle, Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan put a friendly hand on the shoulder of North Macedonian Prime Minister Dimitar Kovacevsky. Both nations are currently candidates to join the EU. Also present was the leader of a former EU nation, the new UK Prime Minister Liz Truss. Pushing the boundary of what constituted Europe, Macron sat down with the president of Azerbaijan and the prime minister of Armenia, two former Soviet republics east of Turkey, who saw a fierce flare-up in armed conflict between them last month before a truce cooled things down. Some dismissed the European Political Community, or EPC, as just talking shop. I would like to thank so much to Emmanuel, to Mr. President Emmanuel Macron for coming up with the idea of uh, EPC. At a news conference, the president of the European Commission said no major platform had been adopted. We did not adopt any official resolution. We just feel the need of having a space for informal exchange of views on ongoing events in Europe and beyond. Anything more might be difficult to manage, not just because of its size, but also because of its diversity and the traditional rivalries between many of its members, from Armenia and Azerbaijan to Greece and Turkey. The 27 EU member countries will go on to meet separately on Friday. U.S. President Joe Biden has decided to right the wrongs on what he called a failed approach to marijuana, announcing that he is pardoning prior federal offenses of simple possessions of marijuana in a historical move. U.S. President Joe Biden announced plans to pardon all prior federal offenses a simple marijuana possession on Thursday, fulfilling a campaign promise ahead of the November midterm elections. In a series of tweets, Biden wrote, quote, There are thousands of people who were previously convicted of simple possession who may be denied employment, housing, or educational opportunities as a result. My pardon will remove this burden. Biden said he had directed Attorney General Merrick Garland to develop an administrative process to issue certificates of pardon to those who are eligible and urged state governors to follow suit. The move will likely please members of his left-leaning political base as Democrats fight to keep control of both the House and the Senate. He also said he was asking federal officials to start a review process of how marijuana is classified under federal law. Marijuana currently falls under the same classification as heroin and LSD. Shares of cannabis growers and sellers surged following Biden's comments. If marijuana classification were to ease at the federal level, that could allow major stock exchanges to list companies that are in the cannabis trade and for banks to offer their services to cannabis-related businesses. Biden noted he wanted limitations on trafficking, marketing, and underage sales to stay in place. Despite a seemingly overwhelming amount of evidence to show serious issues in that particular part of the world, the UN Human Rights Council has voted against holding a debate on alleged widespread human rights abuses carried out by the Chinese government in its western Xinjiang region. 
Just last month, the United States and its allies presented a first draft decision calling for the UN Human Rights Council to hold a debate on alleged widespread abuses in China's Xinjiang region. The move came as former UN Rights Chief Michelle Bachelet released a report on the region citing possible human rights crimes against Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities there. The group of countries led by the U.S. pushed for just a bare minimum of discussion on the matter, believing that by going no further than simply seeking to talk about the findings, other member countries would not block putting it on the agenda. However, on Thursday, countries on the 47-member council in Geneva voted 19 to 17 against holding a debate on human rights in Xinjiang, with 11 nations abstaining. While South Korea was one of the 17 member countries that voted in favor of holding a debate, countries like Cuba, the United Arab Emirates, Uzbekistan, Indonesia and Venezuela were among the 19 countries who voted against it. Among the countries that abstained from voting was Ukraine. China says the push to discuss the issue was taking advantage of the United Nations to interfere in China's internal affairs, adding that if China is being targeted, it's only a matter of time before other developing countries are targeted as well. Bachelet's report, which was released minutes before her term ended on August 31st, highlighted credible allegations of widespread torture, arbitrary detention, and violations of religious and reproductive rights. It brought forth long-running allegations that Beijing detained more than one million Uyghurs and other Muslims and had forcefully sterilized women. China continues to reject the allegations, insisting that it's instead running vocational training centers in the region to counter extremism. Let's go into a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, the head of the International Monetary Fund says it is once again lowering its projections for global economic growth in 2023, citing higher risk of a global economic recession. Warning a further global recession, the IMF chief said it will slash its growth projection for 2023 for the second time. So what is happening is uh, we, are down, we have downgraded three times since October last year our growth projections. Uh, last time we brought 22 to 3.2 percent growth and uh, for 23 projections, is, uh, projections was 2.9 percent. Speaking during a curtain raiser address of the annual meetings of the IMF and World Bank on Thursday, IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva said that the international body estimates that countries that account for about one-third of the world economy will experience at least two consecutive quarters of contraction beginning this or next year. She said the IMF expects a global output loss of about four trillion U.S. dollars over the next several years. Overall, we expect global output as a result of all this to shrink between now and 26, 2026 by four trillion dollars. To give you a sense what is four trillion dollars, this is the size of the German economy. Gone. The IMF chief also highlighted that the world has lived through shock after shock during the past three years or so, including the COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. She added that going forward, she expects that things are likely to get worse before getting better. In a resolution, members of the European Parliament called for an impartial and effective investigation into the killing of the 22-year-old Masa Amini by the Iranian morality police. The European Parliament has called for sanctions to be imposed on Iranian officials following the death of Masa Amini. The 22-year-old Kurdish woman died in police custody after she was arrested for not wearing the hijab correctly three weeks ago. Her death has sparked mass unrest and has forced the international community to once again question Tehran's human rights record. Oslo-based NGO Iran Human Rights says at least 154 people have been killed by national police since the crackdown began. Iranian students were seen protesting outside of her Mosgan University of Medical Sciences in Bandar Abbas on Thursday. While Iran's government, headed by President Ibrahim Raisi, has repeatedly called for unity, 
MEPs in Strasbourg say Iran security forces have used excessive force on demonstrators and are urging foreign ministers to vote on proposed measures on October 17th. Human Rights Watch says Iranian forces have repeatedly been seen firing into crowds of demonstrators. This comes as a monument was set alight in the western city of Nurabad. The fifth in line to the British throne, Prince Harry, is among a groups that launched legal action against the Daily Mail newspaper for phone tapping and other breaches of privacy, which resulted in defamation and other infringements of character. Prince Harry and singer Elton John are among a group that has launched legal action against the publisher of the Daily Mail newspaper. They are alleging phone tapping and other breaches of privacy, a law firm representing the group said on Thursday. The group includes actors Elizabeth Hurley and Sadie Frost, along with Elton John's partner and filmmaker David Furnish, as well as Doreen Lawrence, the mother of black teenager Stephen Lawrence, who was murdered in a racist attack in southeast London in 1993. Law firm Hamlin's said in a statement, the individuals are aware of evidence that points to breaches of privacy, including placing listening devices inside people's cars and commissioning the bugging of live private phone calls. <laughs> Harry and his wife Meghan's relations with Britain's tabloid press collapsed after their marriage in 2018, and the couple previously said they would have zero engagement with the four major British papers, including the Daily Mail accusing them of false and invasive coverage. Associated Newspapers, the Daily Mail's publisher, refuted the allegations. A spokesman described them as unsubstantiated, highly defamatory, and said it appears to be, quote, a fishing expedition by claimants and their lawyers. Google's debut smartwatch will go on sale on October 13th for $350, taking on an industry dominated by Apple and Samsung at a time when inflation is at all-time high and consumers are shunning all forms of expensive wearables. With Pixel Watch, you can simplify your life with the best of Google on your wrist. Google's latest launch is taking aim at the smartwatch sector, a field dominated by one of its main rivals, Apple at a time when inflation-hammered consumers are shunning all forms of pricey wearables. The Google Pixel Watch will go on sale October 13. Priced at $350, the Alphabet Inc. gadget cost $100 more than the lowest-cost Apple model. The other catch? It's limited to people with Android phones. That will open the wearable tech up to enormous obstacles in terms of consumer adoption, according to market analysts. Google apps already work with watches from companies including Apple, Samsung Electronics, and Fitbit, which Google bought last year. The new round face Pixel Watch enables contactless payments, music control, and turn-by-turn -turn directions. A model with cellular connectivity costs an additional $50. Pixel 7 Pro is Google's most powerful phone. Google's Pixel 7 also made its debut. Coming in at $599, the smartphone has a 6.3-inch display. A shinier, enhanced 7 Pro will cost $899, with a 6.7-inch display, further camera zoom, and additional RAM. Though a small player in smartphones overall, Google sales are accelerating. It shipped 3 million phones in the first half of this year, up 131% on a year ago according to tracking company Canalys. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The United States is reviewing various options regarding its relationship with Saudi Arabia after Riyadh and other OPEC-plus nations agreed this week to large cuts in oil production. George Russell, teammate and seven-time F1 world champion Lewis Hamilton, led a Mercedes 1-2 at a rain-hampered second practice session at Suzuka ahead of the Japanese Grand Prix. Forest fires spread across Chile's eastern island, causing damage to sacred Moai statues and affected an area of 60 hectares. Emergency officers and island staff took part in eight hours of combat in an attempt to reduce the spread to the grounds. A fight between two rival gangs in the violence plagued southwestern state of Guerrero left 20 dead, including a local mayor and two more wounded. 
U.S. and Philippine Marines stormed a beach near a disputed rocky outcrop in the South China Sea as part of a joint military drills involving more than 3,500 troops. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. And in case you missed watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we'll leave you with visuals of this year's Comic-Con, self-proclaimed geeks united on the first day of the New York Comic-Con, sporting various of outfits on their favorite fictional characters and playing a variety of video games ranging from Star Wars to Super Mario. Stay safe and have a good night.